Pastors Podcast, part of the Jesus Culture Podcast Network. Great to have you joining us wherever you may be. This is a a podcast for pastors or anybody working in the context of the local church in the trenches. And it's uh, it's it's by we're hosted by pastors, uh, yeah. just in the trenches as well. And uh, really, we just want to come alongside you wherever you are. Yep. We're your biggest fans yep. for sure. sure, and just so appreciate all that you're doing to serve the body of Christ. Uh, absolutely, have loved all of the episodes. All of what has been going on has just been so for me. I'm just sitting taking notes the whole time yep. that we're doing hosts. We're just taking notes. And uh, I'm excited today to be able to bring in, and, and I don't say this lightly, somebody that I have a ton of respect for and just has really impacted my own personal life. And I will say this, by far the coolest individual that we're going to bring on our podcast. <laughs> and that's on. not even... It's not even close. That's not even debatable, yeah. especially because Chris Valentin w- is, is on one of our episodes. And so uh, uh, Bishop Joseph Garlington uh, is joining us today. And Bishop, we really do. I, 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 if you could see right now, if you're watching on YouTube, he has you know, made time for us, is in a hotel figuring things out. But thank you so much for jumping on and uh, just having a conversation with us today. We are here with the real bishop. The real bishop. The uh, real bishop. A few months ago, I got to say, a few months ago, uh, one of my, my daughters, my youngest daughter, Cece, she comes home, she walks in the door, and she says to me, what's up, bish? And all my kids start laughing. <laughs> is that and short now, for bishop? Well, it is now. It's so just, my kids now, they call just, me the bishop, but I, we're here in the presence of the real yeah, bishop. Yeah, so you I, can't. I, I, listen, I, you're I'm like not a, even a bishop. You're a self-proclaimed <laughs> bishop. That's uh, not even allowed. Well, That's debatable. (laughs) That's debatable. Well, Bishop, I sure appreciate you jumping on and joining us today. I'm I'm, I'm glad to be with you, I think. Uh, Yeah, we'll find out. We'll we'll find out quickly. Can you give just real quick context for those who maybe uh, don't know who you are or maybe know you by name but don't know maybe the context of your ministry history and just who you are and what you're doing? Could you just give a quick rundown of that? Well, let's see. I started out in in a Pentecostal setting. Uh, actually, it's a holiness Pentecostal setting, and very very strict upbringing. Um, the let, let me put it like this: the the rules were strict, but very few people abided by those strict rules. But <laughs> they required a whole lot in order to to be saved in in actuality. So I grew up, I was hungry for a lot of things. Our church didn't have a a Bible school or anything like that. And so I found myself in a a fundamental Bible college in Washington, D.C. And I was really hungry. I'd done a a lot of self-preparation reading. And so when I got to the school, it was... It was fundamentalist. I mean, they were cessationists in every way, but they uh, they loved the word uh, at least as much as they accepted. And so I I embraced that. I, I did some study there. Then I went from there to uh, Howard University. Did some study there, and a lot of, a lot of my work has been oriented around personal study, reading, uh, listening, doing the other things that other people do. Spent some time at Fuller Seminary, uh, working there as well, trying to finish out uh, my education in some way that would would meet my needs at least. So that's where I've been. I've been married for uh, 49 years. We'll celebrate our 50th anniversary in September. I have uh, eight children. I've got 13 grandkids and about five great grandkids. And we've been pastoring the church we had a situation in which uh, we planted a church in 1971. I moved to Mobile, Alabama in 1977 to help them plant a multiracial cross-cultural church. We left there and uh, I went to Fuller for a while and then came back to Pittsburgh where we originally planted. And we've been back in Pittsburgh since 1985. Uh, Became, I guess, known as a result of my involvement with Promise Keepers and large charismatic congregations. I've, I've been involved with the uh, the renewal from various aspects with uh, particularly mainline Catholic charismatic renewal, spoken quite a bit for other churches that are in other leaders that were involved in the renewal in the early days. So I have a fairly broad 
perspective of what's taken place. Loved the prayer movement with Larry Lee, got involved with that. Uh, Word of Faith guys, touched very, very deeply by the uh, the revival in Toronto. And so we, we have been, as we say at home, passionately pursuing the presence of God since yes. that outpouring. Long, long time. I told somebody I was raised in the Pentecostal church and uh, lowered into the charismatic renewal. <laughs> <laughs> we actually just had on... Uh, uh, Ephraim Smith, who is an African-American pastor here in town, and he, he was preaching in my church, and he closed out his sermon with a song he sang. And we were talking about you as well, how you will break out in song, and how I'm really upset about it, because I want to do it and can't do it. <laughs> but Ephraim Smith said, he goes, well, he goes, he goes I come from an, you know, an African-American church, and you know, there's 180 people that want to preach. So the way that they, they the way that they filter you immediately is if you can't sing, then you're not preaching either. <laughs> so he said, if you can't sing, you can't preach either. And, and he said, if you can't sing but you can preach, you just become a deacon. That's right. That was what he said. <laughs> so uh, you also, though, I, I don't know if you ever really heard Bishop Garlington preach, but oh man, one one of the best wow. ever. Let me um let me just jump in if we can to the topic right away and something that means a lot to us. We are as you have and still do. We are walking with a lot of pastors. Uh, we have a real heart for pastors. We have a heart for leaders, and uh, I think there's this constant concern coming up. Of it feels like the culture that we're in is is a little bit broken around this, and we just see pastors our age that aren't that that aren't doing well or are burned out or falling morally or even heroes of the faith for us who those heroes aren't ending well. I would love just to take some time and honestly, if we can, if you can just imagine a group of pastors sitting in a room with you right now and just saying, hey, you're somebody who's done it well. Uh, uh, you've done it well, you've done it across, you've had success, you've, had, you know, you've been known, you've pastored faithfully, you married 49 years, like you've done it well. Wow. What, it, what, what is the advice, and that's a really broad general question I'm asking right now, but what is it that, that we need to do to set our lives up to finish well? Yeah, I, th- I think that this is something that's way on my heart is I don't want to go fill stadiums and have a large church and do all this type of stuff and not finish well with my family or my integrity right. or whatever else, my love for Jesus. Yeah. That's a really broad question, Bishop, but I would love for you just to speak into that. Um, I, I, a number of years ago, I, I had an opportunity to... Uh, to speak to uh, a very large group of worship pastors, worship leaders, and and um, my my point, at, at least in working with them, was to ask some serious questions of my own, of myself about how I made it, and 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 of course. Uh, if you had my wife on the other side of this conversation, she could talk about some of the things that I won't talk about, but I, w- I would let her in another setting. But there, there are challenges that, that we have faced. I face in my personal life, face in my marriage. And apart from some, some men of God who had integrity um, and they were willing to confront me based upon uh, character and not charisma, that um, if you've been doing something all of your life, and you do it, and you've learned how to do it. You can do it with or without the Holy Spirit. And uh, I can tell you very clearly, there have been moments in my life and ministry where I knew that I was walking in disobedience, but I would still go someplace and preach. And uh, I would discover that the Holy Spirit would honor his word and he would bless people, even though where I was would be uh, in 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 terms of my walk with him, I wasn't exactly where I needed to be. In fact, in many cases, I was off the beaten path. The problem was that when you're like that and you still see God show up in your meetings, uh, you begin to think that God is ignoring your problem. And, uh, and, and I remember a story that Oral Roberts told about being in a meeting in which he was absolutely worn out. And so, he said, this is the last person that I'm going to pray for. And so he did, and he walked out of the room, and he was walking down the hall, and he said, this lady came after him, and she said, I need you to pray for me to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he says, 
I'm, I'm tired. I'm not praying for news. He said, please. And he turned around in frustration and he just waved his hand and said, okay, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And she started speaking in tongues. And he said, as he walked away, he said, the Lord spoke to him. He said, I didn't do that because of you. I did it because of her. Wow. And, uh, and I think of that, um, uh, 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 an axiom that my, my former pastor shared with me. He said, don't give people the back of your hand, give them the front of your hand, that we tend to think wow. that somehow when God moves in a meeting, uh, you get the credit for it. And what I love about God is that many times he'll move in the meeting and he'll stay hidden and he will allow you to look like you're in a good place. In my lifetime, um, when I was, I, I was just kind of like, hey, look, I'm I can do this, and people were inviting me to come and speak. And but my wife was complaining because there were so many things that weren't going right in our marriage and in our life. And so uh, she confronted me on one occasion. Actually, she on this particular occasion she's confronted me on a number of occasions. But on this particular occasion, when she confronted me, uh, she shared five things, five specific things, and. Uh, and um, I heard it, and then I went back outside and continued to work in the yard. Came back in, and um, she shared those five things again, just in the same order. And then I, I said, "Man, I can't, I can't deal with this." And so I went back outside again. I was, I was leaning on that verse where it says, "It's better to dwell in the wilderness than a contentious woman." <laughs> <laughs> I got outside. Uh, I got, I got thirsty again. I came back in, got some more lemonade, and I sat there, and she gave those five specific things again. And, um, and I prayed this prayer. I said, God, if there's any truth to what this woman is saying, would you confirm it? And so I, I prayed that prayer. I went back outside. Early the next morning, three guys knocked at my door. They were on their way uh, from Virginia back to Buffalo. And... Um, they came to hang out, and I thought, hey, this is great. So Barbara got up, she fixed some breakfast, and then I remembered that I was getting ready to go to a conference um, and, and, and participate in a board that was forming. And, I, I, and when I realized that, I said, hey, I got to go. One of them grabbed me by the hand, and he said, you can't go. All three of them were prophets, incidentally. Um, and one grabbed me by the hand, and they said, um, you can't leave. We came here to minister to you. And my wife said, you look like somebody who got, whose hand was caught in a cookie jar. My eyes got really big. And she said, these guys just started talking to me. And they said, we see several problems in your life. Number one. Number two. When they got the number two, I said, oh, man. And I didn't want Barbara to hear that she was being confirmed. And so I wanted to say to her, hey, why don't you, why don't you wait in the bedroom while, while the men of God talk? And so I, I didn't have the nerve to do it. They confirmed all five of those things. Wow. And by that time, they had my attention. And then here's what they said. They said, in your lifetime, God has backed you into a corner and you were able to get out. They said, he has you in a corner this time and he will let you out. But if he lets you out, he won't ever, he won't ever use you again. Oh, and um, and that was in 1973. And I, I thought, how horrible would it be not to be used by God again after I'd seen him do so many things? And that was when I made a decision that I can't live like everybody else lives because a lot of my mentors in that time were guys who were very, very gifted, but they they weren't really careful about how they live their lives. And so when, when you, what you have around you are models of ministry who appear to be successful, uh, you, you tend to think that God understands your limits and he understands your weaknesses. And so if he puts up with it, everybody else ought to be able to put up with it. But you can't really preach holiness and you can't preach the sanctification. You can't preach living for God. And so those things became critical to me. When I made the decision that I needed to be what God wanted me to be as opposed to being famous, it changed everything in my life. And so I began to walk with God from the standpoint, 
of this. If my wife can't confirm my ministry, I don't have one. That if she can't say to the world, I trust this man and I'm his, and she says to people all over the world, he's my favorite preacher. We, we don't, I told people, we don't argue, but we do have intense times of fellowship. And so they can get very intense at times. But at the end of the day, the goal is, do we want to hear from God? And so that's been the case. So when I speak into these um, these worship leaders, um, I begin to ask myself the question, what has been the secret or what, ha- what are those things in my life that I see as principles? And I'll, I'll just share them with you and, and you can ask me about them. But I have, uh, I discovered late in life that I, I had ADD. Um, ADD is attention deficit deficiency and I had a pretty good degree of it and I could see that in my lifetime in school and every other place that that had been a big part of when I failed or when I didn't succeed that was kind of like the thing that struck um, lightning in, in some way when I embraced that and I began to see what the issues were I also embraced the fact that that there that I had a learning style that worked for me when I allowed it to work uh, and, and that I couldn't be what everybody else wanted me to be. And it wasn't until uh, Bishop Mark Sharona, you guys probably know him. Yep. Um, I've, been, I've been pastoring him for, for years. And so one of the things that Bishop said to me, he said, what I love about you is that you're comfortable in your own skin. And I had to come to that place where I was not going to be dependent upon someone else, how they did what they did. And, and I had to develop my own style of communication, which required me to speak about those things in the scriptures from the standpoint of simplicity. And uh, so my, my life goal, <clears throat> my life goal is oriented around this phrase, making the complex simple that I would go to a class, wherever it was, whether it was a seminary class or something else, and my goal, be on the front row, take great notes. Uh, if you're preaching banning, I'm going to take notes. Uh, I'm going to study you. I'm going to look at how you communicate because my goal is to always be a learner. And uh, I, have, I have the need, in fact, uh, your message, uh, the first time that I ever heard you preach was that message about bicycles. And, um, and I said, what a great analogy. And so I stole it um, <laughs> because I have learned over the years that the secret of creativity is concealing your sources. <laughs> <laughs> so I do that. Uh, but my, my comfort zone was... How do I, and one of the questions that they wanted to, wanted me to answer was, um, what are some important principles for staying power? And so wow. I gave them at the time several things, and I'll just, I'll read them quickly to you. Number one, stay close. Uh, number two, stay in step. Number three, stay out of the way. Number four, stay small. Number five, stay in his presence. Number six, stay out of the limelight. Um, Number seven, stay wasn't. I'll have to explain that one to you. Uh, Number eight, stay childlike. Nine, stay in awe. Ten, stay broken. Eleven, stay with your heart elevated above your head. And I want to read this quote to you that that, uh, I got from... I guess it was James, James Misher. I love his writings. And um, when, when I saw this, I thought, this is so cool. So listen to it. He says, the master in the art of living makes little distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his mind and his body, his information and his recreation, his love and his religion. He hardly knows which is which. 
He simply pursues his vision of excellence at whatever he does, leaving others to decide whether he is working or playing. To him, he's always doing both. And I felt like there's, there has to be a moment in your life when you make a decision that you want to be you want to be simple in your approach, profound if you can be, but not give up simplicity. And uh, so I've studied what Jesus does, how Jesus did it. And I look at the, the most, some of the most effective communicators that I've, I've known have worked at, it seems to me, developing an art of simplicity. So if you want me to expand on these, these things that I shared with you, I'd be happy to do it. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, mean, we're just, I think we're just sitting here in a little bit of awe of yeah. the amount of things that just came. You, know, you spoke about of, of significance. I, I'm just honestly a little bit blown away. Talk to me about staying small. All right. Um, let me just, let's look at that one. Staying small. Um, in, in 1 Samuel 15, uh, chapter 17, Samuel rebukes yes. Saul with these words, when you were little in your own sight, God chose you. And I think one of the, one of the things that happens is that when, when God begins to affirm you and bless you, you begin to think, hey, I'm doing really good. And so with this particular group, I shared with them uh, an opportunity that I had because with this group, I would also do special music. And I did a, uh, I did a selection off of the soundtrack by Larnell Harrison, by Larnell Harrison. And I want to, and it's, it's like the, the desire. I am singing this song and I am, I'm really going for it. And in the middle of the song, I realized how well I was following that soundtrack and I became a little bit more focused on how good I was doing it and, and how much better I could do it. And so there's one place where in the song, I want to know Christ, there's the, the key changes about twice and I had made both changes. And then I heard myself say to myself, you are doing better than you've ever done. Now hit the high note hit the high note. And so I went for the high note, but I couldn't find it. And, uh, and it, it was one, one of the, one of the greater embarrassing times of my life because I am now the singer who's going to be the special speaker. So I'm moving from singing to speaking and I couldn't say, hide me behind the sacred desk. I couldn't walk off and I couldn't go off in tongues because all of those who were there knew that this was a major train wreck with me and the recording. And so I was standing there and I was having this conversation with the Lord. And I said, uh, I said, what happened? And uh, the Lord said to me, you said you were doing this so well. And I said, then I'll let you have it by yourself. <laughs> so, so I said, don't ever do that again. He said, well, don't ever say that again. And so... <laughs> The issue for us and for me is that staying small is recognizing that no matter how good you've been and what God has done to use you, if you don't stay small with it, and and I say, and I, I adopt the the prayer from first from John chapter 15, where Jesus says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And and when he says nothing, He's not saying you can't do things, but you can't do anything that will have eternal value to it. We can do a lot of stuff. And uh, we can get affirmed by it because people may recognize that great principles and great preaching or whatever yeah, wow. works. But at the end of the day, if he's not been in it and it's not him. And so I can go to into a meeting uh, and very often before I'm, I'm invited to go up onto the platform, I find a place where... I can get on my knees and put my forehead on the floor and just say to God, this isn't going to work if you don't help me, which takes me to one of the, the last points that I had. Stay with your heart elevated above your head 
And um, and that came from a friend of mine. I don't know if you remember. Do you remember Mark Dupont? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. oh yeah, prophet. Okay, so Mark was in a place where he had a word. Uh, he's prophesying. He says, he says, it's time to keep your heart elevated above your head. There's a baby that's about to be born. And he says he was trying to figure it out. And it wasn't until the following day he was invited by the pastor of this church uh, to come and pray with him about the daughter who was expecting. And he said, when they got into the room. Uh, it was a lot of stress going on, he says, and the doctor came and said, quick, the baby's in trouble. You've got to get your heart elevated above your head. And so what does that mean? He said, quickly, get out of the bed. And she got out of the bed, great with, with child. And she had to lean over to get her, her head on the floor to elevate her heart. And so I, he said, when he saw that and when he shared it with me, I just wow. said, oh, my God, that the, the, the disposition of bringing into your life the things that God wants to bring into your life is it's birthed out of a moment in which you say to God, I know what my head is saying, but I've got to get my heart lowered. I've got to get my head lowered so that my heart can speak. And so what I see is that true worship in the scripture, whenever people want to do something or say something to God, the best position to do it is on your knees with your head on the floor and saying to God, I can't do this without you. Uh, One of the great pictures of that, of course, is Mary who comes into that crowded room, gets on her knees and wipes Jesus' feet with her hair, but she's elevated her heart above her head. And she did it before when Jesus came and she, she asked Jesus the same question that her sister Martha had asked, but she asked it from a position of her heart above her head. She bowed before him. And I look at that and I see staying small is allowing yourself to believe that the most immense person in the universe is God. When people say, uh, I'm a senior citizen, I'm a father in the kingdom, and, and uh, I keep thinking, uh, how much senior can you be to somebody uh, who is eternal, who is the ancient of days? No matter who you are, none of us are going to become so huge that you still aren't small as far as God is concerned. You ever see the movie uh, Joe and the Volcano? Uh, yes, a long time ago. Long time ago, okay. Remember, Joe Joe is – he's. Uh, maybe, maybe it's not John the Volcano. Uh, I know what it is. It's the, it's the one where uh, this guy is stranded on, on an island and, and he's, he's on this yeah. little raft, yeah. raft that he's built. And he stands up and he sees the full moon. He's out on the sea. He looks up and the full moon is standing there and it's huge compared to who he is. And he realizes just how how small he is. And I think until people can have a revelation of just how small yeah. they are, they won't ever find a place where they can be totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit. So I see this, I, I see this thing staying small as recognizing I'm, I'm going to speak. Bef- uh, I spoke to a hun- well, uh, one and a quarter million guys at the Promise Keepers in 1997, leading worship. And I'm telling you what, I got down on my face and I just said, God, please don't let me screw up. Yeah. I need you. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about the uh, stay out of the limelight. I'm sure that we have a ton of questions. And um, I'm intrigued to see what your perspective would be. So we live in a social media age. We live in an age that is very much like, hey, make a name for yourself. And some of that is hidden in the more people know you, the more you can point to them to Jesus. Like this is literally some of the conversations around the more followers you get, the more that you can point them to Jesus. And so we live in, a, I would say, a unique ministry time simply because of just the inundation of social media and kind of being able to make a name for yourself. And, you know, what, what would, when you say stay out of the limelight, what do you mean by that? And, and, and also things that we've seen, like it, it feels like that's actually counter yeah. what so much ministry philosophy would be. Can you unpack that one for us a little bit? All right. So I, I like the passage in Isaiah 50, 11, 
And uh, New King James says, look, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks you have kindled. He says, this you shall have from my hand, you shall lie down in torment. And uh, NASB says, watch out you who live in the light and warm yourselves by your own fires. This is a reward you will receive from me that it's, it's like I'm, I'm living a life in which I'm walking in my own limelight. I've created the sparks. And so I'm walking in the light of my own fires. And I, I, had, a, I had an experience once. I was preaching in Harrisburg, PA, and uh, they did, a, uh, they did a, a, a news clip. And in the news clip, they were, they were talking about my experiences and who I was. And so they, they actually said, I used to open for uh, a, a, major, a major musician who I never opened for. And I'm thinking, where did they get that from? But it's like they, they cut and pasted something from somebody else's. And so I'm looking at this, and these guys are saying, this guy's so famous, he used to do this. And I'm realizing they have no idea who I am. <laughs> <laughs> And in many cases, I, I use the term, uh, you, you become a legend in your own mind. And here it's critical that you don't believe your own press clipping. So people say, tell me something about you. And then you write some kind of glowing report. The problem with, with, with social media is that it's deceptive and it's addictive because yeah. you may think because of how many people you have online, or how many people are following you, then you have that much influence. And uh, I think the reality is that you can only influence as many people as you can get close to, or people who can get close to people who've been close to you, who can ask folk, what's he really like? Yes. Jeez. The expression, uh, maybe you've heard the expression, but I, I've read some books and 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 I've powerful, listened to powerful. some really significant tapes of people who spoke, and uh, and I just needed to spend some time with them. Wanted to be with them, and after I was with them, I had this disposition. I wish I just read their books. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <Yes. laughs> <laughs> oh, they said, oh. you know, I would have been a lot better off if I could have had a, an opinion of you based on the books. But now that I've met you. Uh, I don't really want to talk about it. And, and my problem, and I, and I think it is a problem because I have met so many outstanding leaders, I, and I mean really outstanding leaders, and uh, who are impacting the nation. And some of them even now are impacting the nation. But I can't have anything to do with them because, A, I know more about them than I want to know. And B, I've heard more about them than I wish I had heard. And so I'm looking at guys who are famous and, and they're on Facebook and, and people are quoting them. And my challenge is when they say, what do you think about them? I keep going back to the passage in Romans, who are you to judge someone else's servant? And so I try to keep my hand off of that, but at the same time, I, I'm, I'm refusing to fellowship with them because their stated values and sometimes in, in some cases their public values are so contrary to the scripture. Um, just to give you one illustration, I can't understand how any solid Christian would, would vacillate on the issue of abortion. But I see a lot of them doing it. And, you, and when they say, well, how do you know they vacillate? Well, they approve people who do the things that are so contrary to scripture. And so for them, it's not just a biblical position, but it's a social position. And I'm, I'm challenged today because I see that a lot, of per, a lot of persons are now walking in the light of their own sparks. And I'm trying to remember who, who used the quote. I'm sure you've heard it before. Um, if the light shining on you is brighter than the light shining in you, the light shining on you can consume you. Mm -hmm. And so people are caught up by the spotlight and, and I'm looking at people who are caught up by the spotlight and their lives are 
absolute wrecks. And I've seen it particularly in the, uh, in the contemporary music world and in the gospel music world. People celebrate talent, they celebrate gifts, but they don't celebrate character. And when you ask people to step back from ministry uh, because of character, they think you're punishing them. Can you can you talk about that a little bit, Bishop? Because uh, you know us three in our conversations, part of my concern and social media just amplifies it. But part of my concern is is we've begun to celebrate the wrong thing. Yeah, we have, yep. and and it feels like to me like we are impressed by things Jesus isn't impressed by. We we are enamored by fame. We celebrate things that I'm not sure Jesus celebrates. How do we keep as pastors, uh, whether you're pastoring a small church and nobody knows who you are except for the people that you pastor and love you dearly, whether you have any level of following or whatever else it is, how do we position our hearts? How do we position our hearts to to be faithful? In, in, in the midst of all of this and not, how do we as pastors not celebrate? Let me back up and say this. There's a ton of people that have, have fallen or it came out that, man, they were jerks or they were abusive or whatever else. But I look at all the pastors that continue to invite them. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, and they weren't surprised when the when it came out that that guy was abusive because they're like, yeah, he was a jerk. He was a jerk. And I'm like, well, you kept inviting him to your conference. Yeah. <laughs> like you kept putting him up on stage, and it feels like we perpetuate things because we celebrate things Jesus isn't celebrating. How do we position our lives and hearts to stop being impressed with things that he's not impressed with, and to stop celebrating what he's not celebrating? I, th- I think one of the things is that it might be helpful uh, to believe the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to write that down. Hold on. We're going we're gonna to tweet that. Taking notes. Tweet, right, believe the Bible. Incredible. I, Incredible. I, I remember uh, an, an, uh, an elderly guy who was sharing with us the, wh- what it takes to develop a successful message. And, and he said he had, a, he had a, 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 a preaching professor who said, he said, number one, he said, preach as though that would be the last opportunity that you have to preach that message. And he said, study, but he says, the last thing he says, he says, whenever you put a message together, he said, it'd be sure, be sure to have a Bible around. (laughs) (laughs) Idea. A lot of what you and I are, are battling is do we really believe what Jesus said? Because we have, we have celebrated the miraculous. We celebrated the, the outstanding things that take place. We've celebrated the person who can sing and move an audience. But if you were to talk to their pastor or like, like one of my guys, I'll use this illustration. He had a guy who was a, uh, a really gifted percussionist. And um, he's, he's struggling because this guy is, is demonstrating moral issues and he's trying to find a way to keep him and yet help him work on his problem. And I, and I said, you are trying to hang on to someone who has challenges. You're trying to hear the will of God in relationship to that. But you don't realize that un- until you disengage from it personally and say, God, I can't accept that this is, is good behavior. And I know that if I let this guy go, that another church is going to pick him up (laughs) because they're waiting for that. And these guys know that that's the case. It's only until enough of the pastors say to people who are involved in music ministry, whether it's preaching or anything else, um, until we agree that we're not going to have anything like that then yeah. we're going we're gonna to be troubled by it. In the late, early 70s, we, w- we had a major conference in Pittsburgh, and it was the biggest in the nation. And each conference, we wanted to open up with, an, with a special speaker who could really make an impact. And so we discussed who should come, who shouldn't come. And one of the first names that was mentioned was a guy who was a notoriously famous as, as a result of his gifts and ministry, but he was also notoriously famous as, as homosexual. And so uh, 
the word was out as to who he was, what he did. And so we said, ah, that guy. So when we finally came to the end of our conference, the guy who told us that he was a homosexual recommended that he come. And so I asked the question, I said, but you just told us this guy has moral issues. He said, yes, but he can get the miracles. And then I realized, yep. all right, so we're not, we're not elevating truth. We're not elevating holiness. We're elevating this thing about miracles and signs and wonders. And I see that as more important to some guys in terms of the notoriety than I see in terms of holiness. And, and so I'm looking at these guys and I'm seeing it on a regular basis. And like I said to you, um, there are just some guys that I'm not, I'm not going to interact with because I know too much about them. I want to invite them to my church. And uh, when I've gone or been invited to conferences where they're going to be a speaker, um, I just simply said to the guy who initiated their invitation to come, he says, oh, man, I'm really excited because we're going to have so-and-so with us. And I said, well, that's, that's wonderful. I said, but can you just remove me from the list because I can't come? And they said, why? I said, I refuse to be on the same platform this guy's on because his life is a moral wreck. And I'm not being judgmental, but I'm just simply saying I don't want to associate or give credence to someone who is a living for God like they ought to live. And we failed to confront, Paul says in Romans 15, um, there's a great book, uh, I think by, by Myron, Myron Augsburger, uh, and another one by another guy, Jay, uh, what's Jay's last name? But he wrote a great book on counseling. And he said, we need to understand in, in Romans that Paul says we need to care enough to confront. The reason we don't do it is because we know that when we confront, the person who has notoriety is going to use that against you. And the next thing you know, you're going to be canceled, so to speak. And yeah. so we're more afraid of man's response to us when we make the confrontation. Yeah, I, I think, Bishop, the thing that I'm just kind of trying to wrap my brain around in the middle of all of this is that when you're talking about the, so many of these aspects of finishing well, it comes back to a conviction around holiness. Yes. And it's, it's funny because I'm thinking through, That's right? That's interesting. We're, we're, yeah. we're, we're talking about, well, how do we steward social media? And how do we steward this? And how do we steward fame? And how do we steward this? And I think what I'm realizing is the key is if we actually understood holiness, we would probably, it would be a compass to navigate through because they're they're kind of complex. Like, yeah. yeah, I don't think it's as easy as be on social media or don't be on social media, right? Or, or it's, uh, sometimes I think we probably offer simplistic answers when yes. the truth is, what we really need is a is like a radical vision of holiness, and yes. probably what's happened in why we have so many people not and finishing well filtered through that is because that's yeah. actually not become the most important thing to us. I, I'm just I'm just amazed that actually that that holiness is is the key that maybe I didn't understand it fully yeah. was. Bishop, uh, one of the things that we talk about quite often is you talk about staying small, staying broken, staying out of the limelight. And we, we talk about just the secret place. Yeah. And we know that we're in this for the long haul, resisting the rush, the, um, you know, the, the shortcuts of ministry. And I, I think of the story of just David, like long before David faced the giant, he was facing lions and bears in the secret place when no one was looking. And I want to ask you about the lions and bears because so much of what you're talking about is that that holiness and and staying small, staying hidden, staying close. Like, what are the, what are some of the things you've done through the years to stay close, to 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 stay somewhat hidden, um, to to do things that no one sees but God, but it it keeps you in a place where where the overflow from your life has actually come from the presence. Yeah. What, what are some of those things that maybe people haven't seen but God's seen? If I tell you, I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> he'll get no it. he'll get no credit for it when he gets to it. heaven. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my 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 first message was an absolute disaster. When um, my pastor didn't do anything to help me develop a message, but yet 
he gave me an opportunity to speak. And so my models were the Pentecostal guys that, and, and I could have you rolling on the floor in tears, uh, about this situation. My, my second message was the same. And so I made a decision in back in those days. And I said, the next time I'm asked to preach, I am going to fast and just put my dependency upon God. My dad died when I was four, but he was, he was a notorious guy who fasted every single day of his life, one meal a day. And so I knew fasting worked. And so I decided that I was going to live a life of fasting. And so I made that one of my priorities. And so over the years, I've discovered that one of the keys to brokenness is fasting. And it's living a life in which you are depending upon God on a regular basis. Um, I have met a lot of people who, when you when you talk about fasting, they, they say things like, are people still doing that? And yet, this, in the scriptures, uh, it's it's so Jesus, true. Jesus says, when you fast. It's not like if you fast, when you fast. David said, I humbled my soul through fasting. And I, I feel like, the key to brokenness has to be where you are allowing yourself to experience a sense of dependency upon God that you can't have under any other circumstances. Yeah. Second Chronicles 7.14, when Bill Bright wrote his book about the coming revival, he said, I, he said he believed that fasting was the overall answer to that particular passage, humbling yourself, praying, seeking God's face. So... I see, I see the discipline of fasting is a very important thing. The, the second thing is that I think people don't really understand how important the whole Bible is. W-H-O-L-E, whole Bible. They, a lot of preaching is just from the New Testament. And, uh, and I say it like this. If you, if you want principles, you go to the New Testament. If you want stories to back up those principles, you have to go to the Old Testament. And so first, uh, Romans chapter 15 says, the things that were written, Paul's writing to a New Testament church. He says, those things that were written before time were written for us yeah. upon whom the ends of the ages have come. It's in First Corinthians. He says, and they've written for us for examples. So I go to the Old Testament and I'm reading and I'm reading because I know that the Holy Spirit wrote the Old Testament knowing that you and I were going to be reading it. Yeah. And so I'm asking God, where are some of the examples of failures, people being used by you, people who, who did the things that they wanted to do for you, but miss it in a number of occasions. And so when I, when I see that people aren't really dependent upon on the scriptures and they're not preaching the Bible, they don't have a good understanding of the scriptures, that's the great, that's a great issue for me because I, I can hear people preach and I'm, and, and I'm thinking, they don't know the Bible. They don't know what God's word says. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the stuff that you get in seminary. You can learn a lot in seminary and you can miss a lot in seminary. And I think if you don't go to seminary with a real good foundation in scripture, seminary will do more damage than it will in terms of add, adding to you what you needed to add. So I, I'm walking through this thing and I'm saying, God, people don't know the word. And here I've come to this conclusion that wow. what we've done yeah. is we preached the church and we, we've not preached the kingdom. Yeah. And yeah. preaching the kingdom gets the church, but preaching the church gets you the kind of people that you have in church because we're talking about growth. We're talking about how to multiply. We're talking about all the things that churches that are not relying on a foundational passage in, uh, let's see, remember in Romans where we're, where the Apostle Paul says, for the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. One of my mentors says, the best way to understand that is to understand it with, uh, with this. The kingdom of God is in the Holy Ghost. And so the, the whole understanding of this kingdom that we're preaching, if we don't understand how much the Holy Spirit is the energizer, the executor, 
uh, the, the official working of it. All the things that we want to see take place can only take place if we have a, a wholehearted reliance on the Holy Spirit. Yeah. If you think it's principles that work, you're going to discover that the principles that you are preaching, if they're not related to the story in the Old Testament that God gives to us, then we are stuck with people who, are don't, who don't believe that the thing that they're doing is it new? It's with Psalms. There's nothing new under the sun. And so I look at, I look at, for instance, for instance, we're talking about social media. If my goal in social media is to increase my numbers, then you can do that. Jesus, if he had been a social media person, uh, would not have been highly used in social media. He wouldn't have had a great audience because Jesus never gave people an option. If you said to the, if you said to him, "What should I do about this?" He just said, "Hey, here's what you do," and they would say, "Well, what if I don't want to do that?" He says, "Well, you do what you want to do. Uh, give all that you have. Come and follow me." And that's what he says to the rich man. And the rich man, he walks away. Jesus doesn't say to him like a good pastor who needed that rich guy in his church. I really didn't yeah. mean it like that. What I was asking you to do was to adopt an inward attitude of detachment toward all of the material goods, so that at any time I ask you for them, you'd be willing to give it to me. <laughs> Jesus says, "Sell it all, give it all away, come yeah, and follow me." So radical. It's amazing. We're eluding the kingdom message so that we can get an audience, but the audience that you're getting isn't going to extend the kingdom because they are not being birthed out of the fires of revival, dependency upon the Holy Spirit, willing to walk away from certain things, willing to say not just no, but heavenly no, I can't be involved in that. And so what we're producing are, are not great examples of kingdom pursuit in which yeah. we say, you know, this is gonna cost you friends yeah, I know, yeah. but it's not going to cost me the kingdom. Oh, man, I, I, the, the, the principle of the presence over principles, right? The principle of faithfulness to the Holy Spirit over out of function. The principle, I'm just realizing like every, everything that pastors are basically taught in a kind of our current structure is, is, that, is that you if you follow the principles, the a, a, B, C, and is gonna, D is going to happen. And, and real, even, even, even how much there is a an idea that this kind of radical vision of holiness is legalism. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just as Bishop, as I'm listening to you talk, I'm just realizing that so much of what's happening in why we're not finishing the race is because everything that is required to finish the race, we basically, we, we, we call holiness legalism. We, we, we exchange principles for the presence. We, 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 yeah, we, we, we actually, in all of, all of these things that are required for us to finish the race, we've, and somehow in some kind of spirit have, 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 have labeled them uh, sinful, labeled them as something anti. And I'm just having this realization. Do we even, do, do we even fast anymore? No. I mean, I, what I a mean, phrase. Do they still fast? Yeah. They, still, they still fast, huh? And this is, I mean, it's the scheme of the enemy, right? My grandpa used to fast. Think they about still it. fast. fast. And, and, Isn't fasting an Old Testament thing? Yeah, like, totally. are we supposed to fast? And I just think what a scheme of the enemy yes. if he can convince pastors that the very things that will cause them to finish well are the things that they should should shy away from. And I, I'm just yeah. blown away. So, Bishop, can I ask a question? They, you know, on your list, you said stay wasn't, and I'm curious uh, oh, if you'll unpack that one. Okay. Um, so, Genesis tells us that Enoch walked with God, and he was not. And then the writer of Hebrews says the same thing. I, I think... If we walk with God, and we are, then we're missing something. The, the, the longer you walk with God, the more you are not. Uh, but it's when, when Sandy begins to be the reason for my existence, say, hey, if you do this, you can increase, you can, you can, you can pay money and increase your Facebook reach, you can do this, you can do that. And, and all the time you're doing that, the question is, You've got to ask yourself the question, at the end of the day, have I extended his kingdom or mine? Yes. Wow. And uh, in some cases, I feel like, um, I feel like you, you can go to a grocery store and you look at the newspaper and say, uh, you, can get a, 
you can get two dozen of grade A eggs for, for 89 cents a dozen. And they've got a couple of other things. And so you go in there with this goal to get this buy. And once you get there, you, what you discover is that everything else is so jacked up. Yeah, yeah. You say, well, what was the point in coming? And so they call them lost leaders. And I feel like we have bought into the lost leader of, of how much social media is accomplishing for us. And the more I understand about that, if you preach the truth, they'll tell you you're going to lose an audience. And what we've got to discover is that, you remember when Jesus uh, said to, in John, John 6, I love this story. He says, uh, unless you eat my flesh and drink yeah. my blood, uh, you can be my disciples. He doesn't explain it's a metaphor. He just, he just lays it out there. And these guys say, uh, can't go with that. And so many walked away and, and they followed him no longer. And so he turns to his disciples and he says, are you going also? And Peter's answer indicated that he had given thought. Yeah. <laughs> And he said, where can we go? You are the one who has the words of life. And I think when they walked away, what we, what we miss is that Jesus continued to make disciples who are now coming in based upon eating his flesh and drinking his blood. There are a lot of people who don't want to pay the price of eating the flesh and drinking the blood, living the life that Jesus wants us to live. And so we think, well, that's just too much. He really couldn't mean that I have to do this. And so we have, we've reduced it. We've dumbed it down. Uh, we've made it so possible for people to come and follow Jesus without having any cost to pay. Yeah, yeah. Bonhoeffer says it like this. When Jesus bids a man to follow him, he bids him to come and die. Nobody yeah. ever made that a song for an altar call. Yeah. Bishop, I love what you're saying about the, the decisions that we make as leaders actually shape the culture we get. And you're saying when we water down the culture, we get a watered down culture, that there was something that happened with Jesus when he, he drew that line that actually created the disciples he wanted that could impact. And I don't know about you guys. I know we're not talking about preaching here, but listening to you talk, like I'm stirred as a preacher. Like the, the way, and I don't know if you do a, like a preacher school, but if you ever do a preacher school, like I am there and I will bring all my friends because uh, I'm inspired by just the, 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 the preaching insight and gift on your life. And I like personally, I carry such a passion to see a gener generation raised up that, that love the word as much as they love worship that come as expectant yeah. to the, the story of God as they do to the songs of God. And, uh, and just as you're talking, I'm, I'm just moved as a preacher that, that uh, you know, I, I want to dive more into those Old Testament stories and <laughs> that affirm those totally. New Testament kind of principles. But I, yeah. I just, I'm, I'm honored. I'm honored that, that you've given yourself to the yeah. word in such a way that young leaders and young pastors yes. like us can yes. come and go, oh man, that, that, I, want, I want that much passion for the story of God. Yeah. You know, and, and so, man, yeah, we, it's we, just, we love you. We it, honor you. It makes me think, I forget if it's in Ezra or Nehemiah, but in the revival picture, and they say, bring out the book. That's what the people say, so, bring out the book. And I'm just like, we need, we need that kind of we revival. We need churches again. chanting, bring, I, I out, the bring out the book. I, I want to I get in front of the church every week and just say, Enoch walked with God and then was not. <laughs> How about you? You know what I mean? Like Enoch. I want to preach on Enoch. I've yeah, never preached on, on Enoch. Let's do it. Well, Bishop, I sure appreciate you taking time. I know that you had to rearrange some stuff to kind of sit down with us, but we sure appreciate you taking time just to share your heart and share some of this stuff. And we're better for it and excited yes, to are. be able to, to share this with uh, other pastors that are out there. So thank you for doing that. You're more than welcome. It's a and, joy uh, to uh, hang out with you. And we need to get you back out. He was out with us speaking, man. It was powerful. It was so good. Yeah, so. it's a privilege. Well, yeah, I wonder well, what I'd done wrong. Uh, I <laughs> a COVID. COVID. I was just like, I don't even know if we have a church anymore. Let's just be honest. I, I, I think they're watching online. I don't know, though. So, 
It's, it's uh, yeah, true. it's how it works. But we're learning, well, they, we're learning new truths in, in COVID. And I told somebody, I said, it's first son. I never thought I'd ever be able to go into a bank with a mask on and ask them for money. <laughs> it's the truth. Well, listen, everybody, thanks for listening. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. If you're listening to any of the podcast platforms, make sure you give it a like, subscribe. We're just honored that you come and spend some time with us. We'll do it again. <laughs>